So today I'm going to tell you about Puzzle Strike. Uh, I'm David Serlin, by the way. Uh, president of Serlin Games, and here is Puzzle Strike, which is a tabletop game I designed, and it's, it's kind of an unusual, a little bit of a weird game. It's sort of like the video game Puzzle Fighter, and it's sort of like the card game Dominion, uh, and, uh, oh geez, yeah, okay, so it's uh, sort of like Puzzle Fighter and sort of like Dominion. Uh, are, are any of you familiar with the video game Puzzle Fighter by chance? Anyone? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, great. Uh, so I want to tell you uh, my thoughts on these two games and why I would ever put them together and what happens when you do and what some of my design goals were and a little bit about how the strategy of the game works and then some of the design problems that I had along the way. So let's start with Puzzle Fighter. So in this video game, uh, on your side of the screen, gems will fall and you put them together into big gems and then you uh, break them and send them to the other side and when you fill up the other side of the screen uh, the, the opponent's side then you you win and that is uh, a pretty standard thing it works the same way in other puzzle games like puzzle bobble or tetris but in my opinion uh, Puzzle Fighter really stands head and shoulders above all the other puzzle games when it comes to being a competitive game. And uh, I want to touch on some of the reasons why. So one of their innovations, maybe the main one, are those circular gems you can see on the left side of the screen. And when a red circle gem touches uh, other red gems, that is what breaks them and sends them to the other side. So it's not like a match three game where like you get three reds that would automatically break. You're actually able to build up as big of a red gem as you want and you can break that when you want uh, by touching that circle gem to it. So what that does is it allows you to control the timing of your attacks as well as how big they are. That's on the offense side. On the defense side, when gems fall on the opponent's side of the screen, they don't fall randomly. They fall in a very uh, predictable pattern, and it allows your opponent to build their side in a certain way so that they don't get too wrecked by, uh, <laughs> by your offense. So, so those two things together, that you can control the timing of your attacks and how big they are, and that defense really counts and matters, are, are sort of the basic elements that you would hope to have in a strategy game. And, and that's good, but that's not why this game is so memorable and so notable. The thing that's so unusual about it is actually its comeback mechanic. Comeback mechanics are common, and we see them in many games, but I haven't seen anything like how it works in this game anywhere else. Uh, so why is that? Well, when, when your side of the screen is almost full, that means that you've almost lost. But uh, it also is when you're at your most powerful. And that's a crazy situation to be in, because when you're almost full, you're actually you're like right on the edge of winning and losing at the same time. So why, why is that? Well, partly because when your side is full, you have all the ammo, you know, you have all these gems that you could potentially send to the other side, and you can realistically send them because of the way those circular gems work. You can kind of hide them uh, here and there on your side of the screen. So you, you have a lot of ammo, uh, you can realistically use it, and there's another rule called the height bonus. And what that says is that when gems are higher up on the screen, when you break them, they will send more to the opponent. So in other words, when you are about to lose, you have the most ammo and every shell of that ammo that you fire uh, does more damage. And it, the, the effect is so powerful that it's, a, it's like a greed test. It's like how greedy do you want to be to get right up close to losing just so you can be uh, really powerful and, and send a ton to the opponent. There's another fun rule where if you send just a ton to the opponent, more than enough to fill their side of the screen, it doesn't drop on them instantly and end the game. Instead, it puts a number over their side of the screen and they have one more turn that they can use to, to, to try to counteract that, to break gems on their side, to nullify what's gonna fall. And taken together, what all this means uh, th th that you can control your offense, that there is pretty good defense, that um, that being so close to winning and losing looks the same, is that a common dynamic that happens is like, I almost beat you and you know fill you up really close to the top and then you're really powerful and you almost do it to me and then I, more than enough to, to fill your side, but you have that one more turn to stay back in and, and you know you dig yourself out and there's this back and forth, back and forth, edge of the knife kind of gameplay. Uh, where it's at any moment someone's going to lose and it's so intense. 
so, so that's, it's very exciting. <laughs> and uh, I played this game a ton. I won a tournament in it in Chicago once. Uh, I talked to another GDC attendee here many years ago about, about some of these nuances and someone overheard me and said, hey, you seem like you know what you're talking about with game design and gave me a game design internship, and that was my first job in the game industry, was because I said some things about Puzzle Fighter. Uh, I later went on to uh, be lead designer of Street Fighter HD Remix and Puzzle Fighter HD Remix with Capcom, so I have a long history with this game. Uh, but I don't have a long history or, or any history with Dominion or any connection to it. It's just a game out there in the world, and some people said, hey, Serlin, you should really check out this card game. So I checked it out, and I didn't really like it. Uh, what, what I did like is that you build your deck as you play, and I think that was a, a natural evolution of card games. It's the kind of thing I was working on, too, so I really liked that. But what I didn't really like is that it's too much multiplayer solitaire. It, it's too much like I build my deck, and you build your deck, and we kind of just do our things, and, and we compare scores at the end. Uh, and that just isn't for me. And so my knee-jerk reaction was like, well, what if it was a little more like Puzzle Fighter? <laughs> and it wasn't that I thought uh, the ideas of Dominion combined with the ideas of Puzzle Fighter would be just the ultimate best game in the world. It, it was more that it was actually just my knee-jerk reaction. And I said that sort of thing all the time. I, I, years earlier, I worked on a, a third-person shooter, and it was like a third-person shooter that used puzzle fighter mechanics. I also worked on a, a shmup, like a top-down shooter like Raiden DX. And again, uh, let's get some back and forth from puzzle fighter in there. Now, neither of those games ended up being made, but um, you can check out the game Twinkle Star Sprites if you want to see a little bit of what I'm, the direction I was going in. I even had a friend who was working on a, a dancing rhythm game, and I was like, what about a dancing rhythm game that's like Puzzle Fighter? So I was just, I was just trying to sneak it into anything, just all the time. Uh, so it's no, it's no surprise. I was like, okay, there's not a lot of interaction here. What if it's like Puzzle Fighter? Uh, but then I, I started thinking, okay, what, what, what would that actually be like? like Maybe this lines up, uh, and then I was thinking about what I consider a good competitive game or some of the elements that I want. So I want a game, if, if it's going to be a competitive game, to be highly interactive. I want to interact with the opponent so that I can outplay the opponent, have the opportunity to do that, to predict what they're going to do, to react what they're going to do, uh, to react what they did. So I, I think there really needs to be as much interaction as possible for it to be skill testing. I also want hype, exciting moments built into the game, not something that's accidentally there, but all that stuff I told you about Puzzle Fighter, it's not an accident that it's so exciting. It comes directly from the rule design. I personally want games that are asymmetric. That means the kind where I choose a character and you choose a different character and we each have different strengths and weaknesses and now that's a, that's a matchup that has a certain dynamic of how it's played and we can switch characters and have a different matchup. That, that's really interesting and really compelling to me, so I knew I wanted that. And uh, of course nobody would want a, a slow, boring start to their game, but it goes doubly so if you're making a competitive game, the kind that would ever uh, be actually played in a competition, like if you're doing multiple rounds of Swiss or if there's ever going to be commentary uh, on it or something in streams. Every turn of the game really needs to pull its weight and, and be there for a reason. So you have to be careful about having kind of samey starts to your game all the time. So let me tell you a little bit about how Puzzle Strike, the tabletop game, works and, then, and we can um, refer to these various points. Um, this is a bit of a confusing diagram, but uh, just bear with me. So in Puzzle Strike, you start with, uh, well, each player has a, a zone called the gem pile, and that starts empty. And every turn, you automatically will get one gem into your gem pile. And you lose the game if you ever end with 10 gems in your gem pile. So if nobody did anything, then after 10 turns, uh, the game would end. There's a universal mechanic in the game called combine, which is the upper left purple chip there. And what that's showing is you, you can combine two of your one gems into a bigger two gem. There's another universal mechanic with a purple chip in the upper, upper right, which is a crash gem. And what that's showing is that you can crash a two gem to break it apart into two ones and send those to the opponent's side. That, that diagram in the, the bottom middle is, is just showing that if you crash a three gem, it sends three to the opponent. 
So this, this concept of, of um, bundling up gems into a big gem and then crashing all of them to the opponent, that is offense. Uh, so what I mean by offense is that I, I said if, if nobody does anything, the game would end after 10 turns. But if I keep sending my gems to you, I'm reducing the number of turns. I'm trying to end the game quickly and uh, fill your side up. So that's offense. Now defense is another mechanic called counter crashing. And how that works, uh, let's, let's take the example that I have five gems in my gem pile and you have five in yours. If I crash one gem, I'm going down to four. I'm sending one to you and you're gonna go up to six. But if you counter crash, it's saying, hold on a minute, before that one gem arrives in uh, my opponent's gem pile, they're gonna crash one of their own gems and send it not at me, but at the incoming gem. So it's like I'm, I'm firing a missile and they're shooting it down. And those uh, gems that meet in the air are removed from the system. So that's defense because it's slowing the game down, adding turns to the game. In this example here, my opponent didn't go from five to six, they actually went from five to four. They, they got farther away from that lose condition. Uh, so that's, that's offense and defense. And um, since I'm covering those, I think it's important to mention kind of the third leg of the triangle, uh, which is economy. And when I think of these, these three concepts, I think of StarCraft, which is depicted in this cake. Uh, so in, in StarCraft, offense is like I build units and send them to your base right away. A defense is something like uh, if, uh, if the opponent is a Terran, they might build bunkers, which is static defense. It doesn't move around, but it's very effective against early attackers. But what do you do against someone who is playing defensive? Uh, th there's really no point in attacking them early because you're, you're sort of wasting your early units. And you also don't need to play defensively yourself because they're not threatening you. You can sort of do whatever you want. So what's best to do in StarCraft is to invest in your economy. And by doing that, a little bit later in the game, you can have so much money that you can kind of do anything. So economy beats um, defense. And in, in the course of a game of StarCraft, there's a dance between offense, defense, and economy, where you're, you're kind of going back and forth between them, depending on what the opponent does. And that same exact sort of thing is going on in the tabletop game Puzzle Strike. So the first item on my list was I wanted uh, uh, interaction with the opponent to be an important thing. And so here's a way to make that the, the, the central mechanic of the game. I also mentioned uh, that I wanted hype, m exciting moments to not be accidental, but to be designed into the system. And they're in Puzzle Strike for really the same reasons that they're in Puzzle Fighter. Uh, when your gem pile is almost full, that means you have a whole bunch of ammo that you can potentially fire off. And uh, there's also a mechanic in the tabletop game called the height bonus. It doesn't work exactly the same way as the, uh, as the video game, but it's the same concept in spirit. When your gem pile is almost full, you can draw more cards per turn. So there's that same kind of bait to be really greedy, to, to build up a lot of gems on your side, because that's gonna allow you to draw a lot of cards and maybe do a really big combo, even though it's putting you close to losing. Uh, the next point I said that was important to me is asymmetric games, games where I play one character and you play another, and it's really beyond the scope of this lecture for me to explain why that's so compelling, but uh, just in case someone needs just at least a little bit of intuition, I wanted to give the example of a Street Fighter match where on the right side we have Zangief, who's a big, slow wrestler, and he needs to get close to you to throw you in order to do damage. And Dulcim, the other character, he has limbs that can extend across the screen and uh, he can spit fire across the screen too. So he wants to keep the opponent away. And these two characters have opposite goals. One wants to get close and one wants to keep away. Uh, that, in most versions of Street Fighter, that's a pretty interesting matchup. And the dynamics of that matchup are different than all the other matchups, so, so that's cool. But if you imagine another hypothetical uh, Street Fighter game that only had one character, like a, like a super character that had all of the moves, you would remove this dynamic from the game. I mean, it, it would be removed because there would be no such thing as one, as I need to get close since you can do as much damage close anyway and there's no such thing as keeping away. So you, you lose something by, uh, by having a symmetric game. I'm gonna uh, 
come back to that point, but I wanted to mention the, the last of my four points I mentioned earlier, Again, or we'll cover it more closely here. That's the slow, boring start thing. So in Dominion, you start with these cards here. Uh, the yellow ones are money, and you use those to buy more cards in your deck. Okay, fair enough. The green ones, uh, here's, a, here's a closer look. Uh, so the, the card on the, on the right is basically blank. At the end of the game, you do get points for it, but when you actually play the game, it doesn't do anything. And that's the opposite of what I'm looking for in a competitive game. I want to get you to the action right away, quickly. It also makes me think of StarCraft again, since uh, in the old days, you started with four workers in StarCraft. Later on, they upped it to six, and nowadays it's actually 12 workers you start the game with. What that does is jumpstart the game and get it to the important decisions quicker. Uh, so I want to give you important decisions quickly. And that ties in with me also wanting you to have different characters. What a character is is like a starting condition that's different for me from you. Uh, so I, it, it was just a natural thing to replace those, uh, uh, those cards with, oh, okay, well, they're chips in Puzzle Strike, but I'm going to say the word cards anyway. But to replace them with, with character cards. So uh, this is a character right here, and right away you're doing interesting things with this character. Um, this diagram was actually made by my playtesters, and what it's showing is the concepts I just told you about, rushdown or offense, defense, and economy, and it's a map of all of the characters in Puzzle Strike and where they fit on that continuum. It just happens to work out really well that you have an extreme rushdown character, an extreme defense character, and many others that are in between. Uh, and th this is not a map of, of where you're completely locked into playing a, a certain way. It's just a push in one direction or, the, or another. Uh, and I was saying before how I just really like there to be different characters in general in just about any game. But in this particular style of game, like Dominion or Puzzle Strike, it's especially important, I think. Uh, in this style of game, there's a common pool of cards that I'm building my deck from and you're building your deck from that same pool. And if we both look at this pool, uh, there's probably just a best deck that can be made. And it's the, probably the best deck that, uh, for me and for you, and that's just, it's frustrating that, that every time we play, we would be, be confronted with this issue that what I wanna do is kind of what you wanna do. That can be mitigated if I can interact with you a lot, uh, but it, it's mitigated even more if I get a push in one direction and you get a push in a different right from the start, and then we're looking at, at the bank cards in a completely different way. Uh, so now that you kind of know how it works, I can tell you some of the problems I encountered along the way. The first problem was that defense was too good. So when I say defense, I mean uh, that counter crash mechanic. That's where like, I break a gem in my pile, I'm gonna send it to you, and you say, hold on a moment, you're gonna crash a gem in your pile and, and nullify the, the incoming gem. From the very first time we ever play tested this, it worked exactly as it was supposed to in the early and mid game. And that's when you need it to work, because if it didn't work then, you, you know, you'd be dead by the time you got to the late game. So that's fine. The problem is, what happens when players use this same mechanic and lean on it heavily in the late game? And what we found is that it was slow and hard to kill people and could be stalemate at times. And it was just generally uh, frustrating that it wasn't anything like uh, what I was going for. You know, I had started with this story of how edge of the knife, back and forth it is, and it wasn't really coming true because of uh, this late game problem. And then I thought, okay, well, what, what can we do about this? Uh, it's not too hard to change some nuances of how that rule works and make it a little less powerful. But when we made it even the tiniest bit less powerful, it failed to work during the early and mid game, and then everything was just all rushed down. So now I'm stuck because uh, I need to make it less powerful, but I can't make it any less powerful at all. There's no setting that actually does what it's supposed to do. And when I get stuck, I thought about StarCraft. Why is this not a problem in StarCraft? So in the early game, you can build bunkers, that's your defense. In the mid game, you can build more bunkers and add some siege tanks, add some turrets, get a very solid defense. But why is it that StarCraft does not have this problem of being like boring and stalemate and taking a long time? It, it usually doesn't. The answer is because they have very powerful late game units, and uh, my favorite is the carriers from the Protoss race. And uh, 
so you build a fleet of carriers, you can just kind of take out anything. And with that in mind, it really helped me realize what we needed to do in Puzzle Strike. You need to be able to build up to something that just smashes through defense. And the main thing that you build in the game are the, the gems, combining them from one gem to two gem to three gem to four gem, which is the biggest. So we should make the four gem big and, and fancy and special and look different and have a special rule that says when you crash a four gem at someone, it is uncounter crashable. It simply ignores the defense rule of the rest of the game. And as soon as I did that, it worked immediately and it went back to uh, edge of your seat, back and forth, back and forth. So that was a success and it's in the shipped game. The second problem I had though is that offense was too good. <laughs> Okay, so to even explain what I mean by this, I've got to tell you about something called mono purple. So mono purple, um, it, every time you play Puzzle Strike, you're building a, a deck, you're building your deck from a set of cards that always contains these purple ones. And then there's a bunch of other non-purple ones that change every time. So if you are playing in a mono purple way, what it means is you kind of ignore the, the rest of the game and you only just build these, build a deck of these. It's kind of a degenerate strategy. And if you talk to some people, they will say that the first version of Puzzle Strike um, was, was broken and was just all mono purple, it's all you should do. That is, that is not true. But I'll tell you what is true, there are real problems. Uh, one problem is that if a new player uses this kind of naive strategy, it takes quite a bit to beat it, uh, which is kind of uncomfortable. You know, you'd hope that a simple strategy wouldn't be too hard to beat, but you really do kind of have to know what you're doing to beat it, so that, that's a negative. Uh, but what about the experts? If you look at games uh, between the best players, is that all they're doing? And the answer is no, it's back to this. You saw decks on ev every point of this spectrum and it looked pretty healthy. The problem is that when they were using a rush down strategy, a lot of the times that meant they were going mono purple. You know, not when they're doing econ or defense. Um, but I, I said, okay, that, that's not good, because that means like a third or almost a third of our strategy space is this thing where you ignore most of the game. Like, we can't have that. Uh, the game had already shipped at this point. And my players uh, disagreed and said they actually really liked how it was. But I, I complained more and more and said I really didn't like that. You know, it's too hard for beginners and like, should experts really be doing that a third of the time? Uh, and we were trying to make an expansion which had new characters and new cards to build your deck from. And my player said, okay, we'll just be really smart about it. When we make the new characters and we make new cards, we have it in mind the whole time that we, we want to kind of counteract this tendency for some people to just buy the purple chips. So that's what we did, we worked on that. And uh, here's how that went. So making cards for this game I don't know exactly why, but it is the hardest design thing I've ever encountered on any game that I've worked on or consulted on. And it's, it's something about how the systems are so intertwined that like if you, any card that gives money or actions or whatever, it has ripple effects that have all sorts of unintended consequences and it's just really hard to make anything at all. Uh, I mean, I can deal with that, but just saying it's hard. Uh, but there's a second thing that is absolutely backbreaking. That's much worse than that first thing. So I would come up with an idea for a new card in the, the expansion, and players would, uh, my play testers who knew what they were doing, they'd say, oh, you, you can't have that. Nobody would put that card in their deck. Uh, they would just mono purple instead. And I would shake my fist and I'd buff it and then give them a new version. They'd say, still the mono purple thing. Then I'd buff it again. And they'd say, okay, now you'll use it, but it's actually broken. Like uh, you could just instantly win the game with this. And, and it happened again and again and again and again. Uh, and if, finally one time uh, it was just too much. It was like, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back and I, I flipped out and I upended the tea table and I said to the tester, you will never tell me again that I can't have a thing because of this mono purple business. Like we can't go on like this. Uh, we have this tiny, thin film of design space where it's powerful enough to be better than the purple chips, but not broken. And we can't go on like that. Like the, the, the whole endeavor of let's address this piece by piece, band-aid by band-aid on, on each card has failed. It's utterly failed. And we need a system-wide change. 
uh, they, they were skeptical because they kind of already liked the game. But they said, you know, what's the change? And I said, I have no idea, so please help. And we got the whole, the whole testing community to help. They all submitted ideas. And this went on for weeks and maybe months. And I, I kind of felt like a Christopher Columbus saying, you know, there's going to be this new world. But then after a while, people are they're skeptical. Like, is there ever really going to be land? Uh, everyone involved kind of knew that uh, a lot of these ideas sucked. You know, even though they're proposing them, they're just trying their best to come up with some way that that addresses our problem of the design space being too small. We tested a whole bunch of ideas. Often they were too complicated or simple, but didn't do what they were supposed to do. And uh, just after being stuck on this so long, I was like, OK, well, what would StarCraft do? <laughs> so let's think about uh, our problem in, in, in my game compared to StarCraft. In StarCraft, you might build some Zerglings and send them at the opponent's base. In Puzzle Strike, you might put some purple chips in your deck and combine, combine, crash. Kind of similar. Uh, in StarCraft, if they counter you, then you lose your Zerglings. But in Puzzle Strike, if they counter you, you actually get to keep all of your purple chips because they will cycle back. That's like the, the Dominion mechanic. Is the, the same cards are going to cycle back to your hand later. OK, that's, that's some cause for pause. In StarCraft, in order to do an effective rush, you have to cut back on your economy. So if they counter you, they're going to be ahead in economy. And then later on, that's going to be a big deal. In Puzzle Strike, you don't really get behind in your economy when you uh, try for this rushdown. You get a little bit behind in the number of actions per turn you can use, but you don't really get behind in economy. And that is very questionable. And then on top of all that, in StarCraft, even if you could keep your Zerglings, they're not really that relevant in the late game because they're not that powerful. But in Puzzle Strike, uh, the same purple chips are really great in the late game. So when you frame it like that, it's completely crazy and totally out of whack. It's, it's, it would be like the, you could attempt a rushdown with almost no risk, uh, even if you're countered and you're, you're happy with the results. So uh, something's wrong there. Uh, you need to be behind economically. OK, so let's look at the chips. Crash gem, you, you break a gem. Uh, it sends it to the opponent. Also, you get you get a resource. You get a dollar. The idea being that there's it's called gem power. Actually, it, there's power inside the gem, and you're releasing it uh, by by crashing it. But that's really suspicious. You know, isn't that the problem? Can we delete that? Uh, turns out we can't. That's it's too long of a story. But it messes everything up if you delete that. Okay, fine. What about the other purple chip though? So this one is when you put two two gems together. And I, I was thinking, okay, thematically. Uh, it's the opposite. So what if it took energy to put the gems together, and then you release the energy when you crash it? So maybe you have to pay a resource to do this. And uh, so that's, that's thematic. But what about the dynamics? Uh, if I choose to do combine, combine, crash against you, I'm starting to rush you down. And if that costs me $2 because of the two combines, but you could defend without spending that, you're getting $2 ahead economically. And then I might rush you down really hard and do it again, combine, combine, crash the next turn, and now I'm $4 behind. And that sounds like the kind of check and balance we need uh, where defense can actually counter offense. So here's what the change would look like. It's just adding a minus $1 to it. Uh, and uh, I came up with this, this idea and made this graphic. And then I went to post it on uh, the forums, you know, the forums that we had gone on for weeks or months trying to come up with an idea. There was uh, an HTML error uh, that it, when I posted it, and it accidentally took up the whole screen of the forums. It was just like the forums was just this one enormous chip. Uh, and the players were like, wow, it's so big. It's, uh, it's so dramatic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I might have got some points for that. So. I think a lot of the players at that point realized that was it. That was exactly the solution we needed. There were some naysayers, and they said, you can't just put an extra minus $1 on this thing. It's going to, you need to redo the whole game. You need to rebalance everything around it. And I thought that was bogus. So we tested a little bit, and it turns out that uh, about 80 or 85% of the cards, they worked better, not worse with that. And it makes sense because when you take offense, defense, and economy, and one of them is kind of like misaligned out of whack, and you, and you make them make sense to each other relatively, all the work that we had done, it just kind of worked better. Then the extra 15% of cards, uh, something about them like may have relied on, on money especially much. 
and so we had to adjust those, but it was easy to pick them out, easy to identify them and fix them. So we did and sh shipped this and as a new edition and it totally worked. Um, so the summary of all this is that Puzzle Strike, it has a structure that's similar to, to Dominion, but all the dynamics are really modeled after Puzzle Strike. And then every time I ever got into trouble design-wise, I looked to StarCraft for the answer. So StarCraft is kind of the, the secret unsung hero of the game. And that's my story. Thank you.